as I was thinking about this whole concept of fighting the good fight of faith and the uh, spiritual warfare and the weapons that we use, um, and particularly in light of the next passage where Paul continues in verse 12 to say, take hold of the eternal life which you were called when you were made good, when you made, you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The thing that really struck me was that um, taking hold really means literally to seize something with both your hands. And it's a very intentional grip. It's grabbing something and holding it and saying, I'm not going to let it go. I mean, regardless of what happens, I'm going to hold on for dear life, both physical life and in this case, eternal life. Um, I was reminded of something that John MacArthur said many years ago, and I thought was really a, one of those marvelous uh, phrases that um, the Holy Spirit gives people. He said, basically, the problem with uh, much of the church in the West today is we suffer from what he called easy believism. And it was a theological belief, or basically a philosophical belief, that um, the Christian life uh, was something that was easy. You ask Jesus into your heart, he fixes your conscience, he heals your sins, he puts your life together, and you live happily ever after. And, and so often people who come into the church that way are like the seed that falls upon the rocks. They have a lot of joy and excitement. They sprout up and they seem to be filled with the Spirit. And as soon as difficulties come, Jesus said, they just wither away. And I saw that, I've seen that happen so many times, so heartbreaking that basically I came to realize that uh, it takes time for people to really bear fruit. It takes time for people to really give evidence that they have truly been born again of the Spirit and truly have Christ living in their heart, that there are a lot of people who uh, come into the church based upon an emotional experience. I was watching a video, a very sad movie about, uh, you know, a ministry that collapsed. And it was interesting because uh, everything about the, the church services was bells, hoops, and whistles. It was very entertaining. The music was incredible. Uh, they had lights, cameras, they had action. And uh, I was saying to you know one of my sons, I said, well, the, the teaching wasn't very deep. In fact, it was pretty shallow. And he said, he said to me, nobody went there for the teaching. They went for everything else. And they were these people who figured it out. They had, you know, a market shelf full of things that were fun and, and far out and groovy and cool and so forth. But there was no, no really rooting of people in the love of God. And that's one of the, Paul, the things that Paul said in Romans 8. He said that we need to make sure that people are rooted in the love of God. And that rooting happens uh, not only by the experience of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but it happens when we grow in the knowledge of His Word. Because it's only in the reading of His Word when we really discover who God really is. That's when we discover how great He is, how, how loving He is, how just He is, how powerful He is. It's revealed to me through His Scriptures. And... Um, you know, many times people's entire devotional life is based upon, you know, Instagram or some kind of snippet here or snippet there. Maybe they read the daily bread every day or they go to church once a week and have an inspirational sermon. That's really kind of like living on cotton candy or, or trying to survive by eating suckers. You know, after a while, the sugar high is going to wear off and you're going to find that you're not healthy, you're not strong. And in fact, you're beginning to really spiritually starve to death. The only place way that we can get truly fed in the Spirit is to be in the Word of God. And that's why I would even say that if what I'm doing here with you today is a substitute for you spending time in the Word every day, then do me a favor, stop listening to me and go start reading your Bible. <laughs> I mean, I don't, because I don't really, I'm not trying to build something here. I'm just trying to share with you what God says. And, and the most important thing that you can do is be to be rooted and grounded in God's love based upon growing in the spirit and in the knowledge of his word. It's that witness of two that is true. And God gives that to us. He gives us a spirit in our hearts, and then he gives us a witness of the Bible. The Bible, which was written by spirit-filled men, has spiritual truth that resonates with people who are spirit-filled. That's why before I was a Christian, I tried to read the Bible, and man, I tell you, it was, there was nothing there for me. I couldn't make heads nor tails out of it. It meant nothing to me. It was just not very interesting. And then when I got saved and I picked up the Bible because I felt like I was supposed to, nobody even bothered to tell me to do that, one of those little oversights, you know, 
I started reading it and I thought, my goodness, this is the most fantastic book I've ever read in my life. And so for the next uh, 54 years, almost 55 years of my life, I've been reading this book on a daily basis and I found it was transformational because nobody had to tell me the Bible is God's word. I've discovered it because God spoke to me out of it. I mean, you take all the apologetic arguments that are used to say the history, the reliability of text, and so forth. All those things are true and they're valuable to a point and they're helpful. But the point is that God speaks to me when I read his word. And when you begin to have that kind of fellowship with God through his word by the Holy Spirit, it's transformational. Your faith grows your confidence grows, your understanding grows, and you begin to make wiser decisions and more effectively live your life. And so it's really important that when Paul uh, goes on, he says, what you need to do is not only fight that fight, but when you go into that wrestling match, you need to grab on and hold on and not let go. And that's why a lot of things I, I tell people is that you need to, to grab hold, take hold of the Word of God, and you need to hold on to it tightly and make it part of your life. When I was first a Christian, I didn't go any place without this Bible. I carry this with me everywhere because I never knew when there would be an opportunity to sit down and read it. And the only book that I read, uh, there was one exception, but the only book I ever read in the first five years that I was a Christian was the Bible. Now you may say, doesn't that make your education very narrow? Listen, I, I'd been through three years of college by that point, and I, I don't know that I knew much of anything, but I'll tell you what I did know. I knew that I learned more from reading the Bible than any other book I ever read in my life. And as a consequence, I found that my life began to turn in a direction and move in a direction that I had always wanted it to, but never understood how to get it there. The simple fact is that the peace, the joy, the power that comes through the Spirit begins to flow into your heart and mind as you read His Word and He speaks to you. And what happened in those five years where I read the Bible every day and only the Bible, and I'm not saying you have to do this, but I had no TV, I had no radio. I mean, I really had no contact, not by design, that was just the reality of my life for the next five years. During that whole period of time, I became immersed in the scriptures. And so that when I would think of stuff, the Bible verses would always come to my mind. They became, became the interpretive grid by which I dealt with the affairs of my life. And one of the things I discovered that even from some well-meaning Christians sometimes, they would give me advice and I would just listen to it and take it in and pray about it. And I would just think to myself, somehow that doesn't ring true with what I feel in my heart. And then I would open the Bible and begin to read and go, oh, that's because what they're telling me isn't in accordance with Scripture. It's the best wisdom of man but it falls far short of the wisdom of God. You see, earthly wisdom, your wisdom, my men, manly wisdom, can basically look at a situation and based upon past experience and history, we can draw a certain conclusion. This seems like the best thing we could do. But God's wisdom goes beyond the moment. It goes into the future and sees what's coming and enables us to make decisions sometimes that aren't completely rational to us. We can't even necessarily totally explain it, but we simply say, I just feel in my heart, this is what God wants me to do. I tell you the truth, that's why I'm living in Spokane, Washington. I've been here for the last four years. It wasn't because uh, I got good advice. In fact, I got tremendous amount of counsel and advice not to come here for a whole bunch of what seemed really good, rational reasons. But I look back at that, I remember sitting there, and my wife and I just looking at each other and going, regardless of all those arguments, we know that God, this is what God wants to do. We know this is His will for my life. Um, unfortunately, the people who gave me that uh, wrong advice never came back and said, you know, I, I was really wrong. You were supposed to go to Spokane, <laughs> but uh, that's okay because I'm still in ministry and they're not. But the thing I think that really stands out in my mind is that when we listen to God based upon what we've learned to be true about God in his word, more so than where David said, I have more wisdom than my teachers, what he was simply saying is, because I'm listening to what God is saying to me, and he knows more, obviously, than the smartest beings that have ever lived, and as long as I listen to his vice, 
and particularly as long as I reject demonic advice. Remember what Jesus said to Peter when Peter said, I won't let you die. He says, Peter, get behind me, Satan, because you savor the things that are of man, not the savor the things of God. So a lot of people who want to give you good advice are people who want to advise you to make you, to get you to do the things that they think will benefit you the most in this life. But that's not necessarily the most important thing because ultimately my life is like a vapor that passes away and then I go into eternity and I want to make sure that I'm storing my treasures in heaven and not necessarily here on earth, that I'm making decisions about my future based not upon the years that I have upon this planet, but the real future that I'm looking forward to, forward to, which is in heaven with my Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we'll continue on tomorrow. Blessings.